Okay, um, before or as we begin this morning, I actually want to take a minute and uh, we're going to kind of go back to church for a minute just because uh, I know that even though we have assignments due and there are so um, many things that are going on at Southeastern, life doesn't stop. And I actually had a crazy day today. Uh, my grandfather was taken to uh, the emergency room and they're not quite sure what it's looking like as far as whether he's going to make it to the end of the week and all these different things. So it's been quite the day for me. Um, I apologize if I get emotional, but uh, I just want to take a minute and I know that each one of us have real needs in this place and we have real uh, moments in our heart that we just need something from the Lord. And so if you guys would just pray with me. Uh, I know that if you have a need, I want to encourage you. I know we're not in chapel, and I know we're not in church, but how many, of you, how many of you believe God can still move when we're in a classroom, and he can still be the comforter, even when we're not uh, like in our quiet place or something like that? So if you have a need, I just encourage you, just reach out your hands, put it in a cup, and or like put your hands as a cup, and just receive what God has for you today. And I'm just going to pray uh, just over this message and over each one of the needs that we have. God, we come before you, and we just ask that your presence would be made known to us. God, we know that you are the God of peace, Lord, and I just pray over my family, and I pray over the needs that are represented in this room. God, I pray that your spirit would be evident, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would come to comfort, that you would uh, just begin to speak to our hearts, Lord, that you would uh, remain constant, Lord, that you would remind us of your faithfulness, even in times and circumstances that our plans don't seem to be plan panning out how we plan. God, we know that you're in control, and we know that you are faithful even in those moments. And so we call upon your name today, and we ask that your presence would be made known, that your comfort and your peace and your joy uh, would just be upon all of us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, so today, uh, I am going to tell you guys a story, and I'm really excited about this. I've never... Uh, preached a sermon in this way, uh, acting as if a character. So we're going to do this, and I'm really excited about it, uh, because the Bible is full of stories, and there are stories in the Bible for just about any scenario, any situation. There's stories in the Bible that make you feel sorrowful, and there's stories in the Bible that make you feel joy, ones that make you feel love, and uh, un uncomfortable, uh, discomfort, comfort, all those different things. So the Bible is full of stories that connect us to what we're feeling today. And I believe, I mean, Jesus' main form of uh, preaching and his main form of communication a lot of times happen through stories, happen through parables. So there's something about telling a story that helps us to connect a truth to the story and to the character. It makes the Bible feel real. So before we begin, um, I'm going to have, if you don't mind, turning to uh, Luke 1. That's actually the scripture that we are going to uh, be starting in. And I'm going to read it beforehand. Uh, I'll kind of be referencing a lot of this scripture and then also scripture in Esther chapter 2. So if you want to kind of keep your finger there. Uh, but before I actually go into it, I'd love to just read you the scripture because how many of you know faith come by hearing and by hearing the word of God. So we're going to go right into it. Uh, Luke chapter 1, and we're going to start at verse 26, and I'm just going to read this small passage. Uh, it, verse 26. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a small town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel of the Lord said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked, since I'm only a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. 
I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. You know, word travels fast in a small village like Nazareth. I mean, I remember my friend Rachel once, she was, she was caught <coughs> Let me just say, the entire town was in an uproar within five minutes of finding them together alone. It didn't take my parents more than ten minutes to have me seated down on my pallet on the floor. And they were, I remember my mom's voice so clearly saying, Now Mary, you know that you are of marrying age. You must remain pure. It is the greatest gift you can give to a husband. But not only that, it is the only way a wealthy young Jewish man will take notice of you. I can remember it like it was yesterday. But not only were my parents so concerned about what the town had to say, the town itself was concerned about my future, about my family. I don't know if any of you have grown up in a small town, but most of the time, Betty Sue, who lives next door, really does care what you're going to eat the next day for dinner. It was the same thing in my small town of Nazareth. And so uh, my whole future was planned out. From the time I was years old. They said, you're going to marry, and you are going to have children. What else is a girl my age supposed to do? I mean, I'm 15. That's what I do. I have children, I get married, and I live a pious life. <coughs> but, I mean, I guess you can imagine what they thought when my plans came crumbling down, when everything that I had planned for all of a sudden didn't look like it was going to be the same. I mean, it was just a little while ago that my parents uh, told me that they had accepted an offer for my marriage. His name was Joseph, and I mean, they say he's a good man, that he'll be respectful. They say that he will like, treat me so well and that he'll take care of me. He's a carpenter. But imagine the shock on his face when I told him that I was with child. I still, I can remember the look in his eyes when I told him and when I told my parents and the shock that they had and the disappointment that came from their faces. But in those moments of seeing that disappointment, I can remember the very words that the angel of the Lord said to me. I'll never forget when I was on my way. My, it was the day the angel of the Lord came to me. It was just a few months ago. My mom had asked me to go fill the water jugs for dinner. So I was on my way to the well, and it was a beautiful sunny day. The clouds, there was no clouds in the sky. The sun was shining. There was a nice, beautiful breeze. I could even hear the children playing and laughing in the village right behind me. And it was in that moment that I heard something behind me. So my curiosity took over, and I turned around, and there was a man standing there. I didn't know what to do. It was the most beautiful sight I'd ever seen, but yet I was terrified. He said to me, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. I couldn't speak. I, I stood there frozen. I, could, I tried to blink to see if he would go away, and it, it wasn't a dream. He was still there. I tried to run, but my feet were stuck on the ground. I didn't know what to do. But his words rang so much truth. He said to me, Mary, do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. You will be with child and will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. My mind was spinning. I didn't know what to do. Could it be true? Could he actually be speaking from God to me? How could I be with a child? I've never even been with a man. And yet it was in those moments of confusion and questioning, the only thing I could do, and the only thing I thought of, was actually sitting on my mom's lap as a little girl. I sat there, and in those moments where I was trying to figure out what the angel was saying to me, I pictured myself sitting there and my mom telling me the stories of old. The stories that have been passed down generation to generation. And the one that kept coming to my mind was that of Queen Esther. Queen Esther, she was a, Esther was a young Jewish girl that was living in Babylon from the Jewish exile. And when the king had found a fault with his current wife, he ended up 
uh, banishing her and looking for a wife all over Babylon and Susa and Persia. It was, am it was amazing. I remember even me and my sisters used to take turns dressing up and twirling around our house in our beautiful gowns thinking, oh, could I be the one this time, Esther? Uh, could I be Esther, the one that was chosen this time? We take turns uh, being her and being the one that was chosen. And so I remember the story of Esther, and I remember one of the most profound things that my mom used to pray over me, and it was found uh, in the moments of questioning and confusion for Esther when Haman, the king's right-hand man, had uh, made a plot to kill all the Jewish people, to kill all of Esther's people. It was in those moments of confusion and of questioning that Esther's cousin Mordecai gave her one of the most profound statements. And I remember my mom praying over it, over me uh, as a child, and it said, For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to a royal position for such a time as this. For such a time as this. For such a time as this. The words rang in my head as I stared back at the angel. Could it be that for such a time as this, God had called me to carry the Son of God? Could it be that God's chosen person, a humble servant? I mean, I had to obey. My only response had to be obedience. I didn't realize that the next words out of my mouth would change the course of my life. And I certainly didn't realize that the next words out of my mouth would change the course of history. But the only thing, the only response I had to the voice and the call of God was to look at the angel and say, may it be to me according to your word. As I stepped out of character uh, and back into this room and into today, the question still remains. How will you respond to the call of God? Throughout history, God has raised up leaders of their generation. Uh, for Esther, it was her willingness to obey the voice of God that led to the deliverance of her nation. And with Mary, it was her willingness to obey the voice of God and the call of God that led to the deliverance of all nations and all people. And so in the same way, God has called us and he's given us a uh, he's chosen us for a specific purpose and a specific reason. And I want to challenge you to question, what is your response to the call of God? Uh, Acts 20, 24 says, However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. As ministers of the gospel, that is our call. Our call is to testify of the good news, of the grace of Jesus Christ. And as we go into these next seasons of our life where we are uh, giving our life to this thing called the gospel, to Jesus, let your response be a willingness to obey the voice of God despite what it, the outcome could be. Esther had to say to herself, if I perish, I perish, but no matter what, my willingness to obey the voice of God is there, and it doesn't matter what this outcome is, I'm going to obey the voice of God. Mary, in the same way, her willingness to obey the voice of God uh, put her in a place where she was going to, she was going to suffer, she was going to be uh, disgraced, and she's going to be shamed from her family, and all, I'm sure the whole village uh, took quite note of what was happening in this moment, even though Joseph ended up taking the child as his own. Uh, there's still consequences, and you never know what it is, but, you're, but the way you respond to the call of God is so important. And how many of you have ever been to a camp meeting? Camp meeting? Well, I am old school Pentecostal, and I know that the glory of God dwells at camp. <laughs> Whether it's summer camp, winter retreat, anything like that, there's just always, for me, I've always experienced just a great moment in the presence of God at camp. Not that it can't happen anywhere else, but that's just where uh, I've experienced some of the most impactful moments in the presence of God in my life. And I remember being a senior in high school, um, and I'd already been planning on doing ministry. Uh, it was something that I really felt like I wanted to do. It was something that I felt like the Lord was calling me to do. 
But it was, there was something different about this call to the altar. And usually at summer camps or winter retreats, especially in youth group, they'll have a time where if you feel called to ministry, like why don't you come to the front and uh, respond to what God was saying. And I remember thinking, okay, well, I've done this a few times, but yes, I feel called to ministry, so I'm going to go, and I'm going to go to the altar. And there was something different about this time, and I don't know what it was, but when I got to the altar, I fell to my knees, and I remember asking the Lord, Lord, what do you have for me? I know that you've called me to ministry, but for some reason, this feels different than before. Uh, and it was in that moment that I really felt the Lord remind me that uh, this call went beyond my circumstance and it went beyond what I had previously thought of. This call of God was, dis uh, it didn't matter what I had to give up, this was what I wanted to uh, follow. And so I just encourage you guys to have a moment in the presence of God where you really respond to his call and are reminded that this call uh, is for the cost of the cross and that you might have to give up things and you might have to uh, give up things that you've desired for a long time, but yet the call of God is so much greater. Uh, Matthew twenty two fourteen also says, many are called but few are chosen. If you're like being chosen and being chosen to be uh, one of those who speaks the word of God is a task that is so great it's hard, it's scary, it could be something that um, we're not expecting, but at the same time, God has given us the grace to complete it, and he's called us, and so our response, let, it, let your response be uh, that of, may it be done to me according to your word. Whatever it is, God, whatever it is, God, I'm willing to go, I'm willing to speak, and I'm willing to uh, take on your call. Amen. <laughs> Yeah.